Tonight we look at an extraordinary man and an extraordinary pianist, John Ogden, who's recovered from a crippling illness that destroyed part of his career. In 1962, a young Manchester pianist, John Ogden, won the second Tchaikovsky piano competition in Moscow, along with the Russian, Vladimir Ashkenazi. His success led to a brilliant international career as a concert pianist, and perhaps to a mental illness that destroyed his career in the 1970s. Eventually, John Ogden recovered, and over the past ten years, he's regained his reputation as a piano virtuoso. Last year, he played one of the most demanding piano works in existence, all four hours of Sir Abge's opus, Clavicambulisticum, to great critical acclaim. The story of his violent breakdown has been told, sometimes sensationally, elsewhere. Our film concentrates instead on the musical side of John Ogden's career. One of my earliest musical memories. My parents had a pianola, a Weber duo art, and they had a roll of Shepherd's Hay with Percy Granger playing it. And I remember the strong impression the pictures at the side of the roll made on me, you know, how fresh and fine they looked. My sisters and brothers and myself, we used to spend many happy hours round the pianola. I got fascinated with the way the pianola made notes depressed, and I think that started me off exploring the piano a bit. And I started notating music in a pianola notation under the impression that was musical notation. My father was an English teacher who played the trombone and the xylophone in his spare time and also enjoyed bell ringing, which of course is famous in literature through Dorothy L. Sayers' The Nine Tailors. He gave me great encouragement, as my mother did also, and he himself, my father, was keen on Wagner's music and wrote an essay on Berlioz's sense of the macabre and one or two other sort of essays of that sort. Her home was a very happy place with the pianola. I remember going to John's house uh, in Manchester and one would spend a whole day there. A lot of the time we would be eating and drinking cups of tea. His mother was a very, very generous hostess. And a lot of the time, when his father was there, we'd be discussing English literature or religion, or I remember particularly his father had some very interesting books about witchcraft. The discussion was very general, not limited to music at all. And it was. I think, a stimulating household.
when I was at Manchester Grammar School, I got a lot of volumes of music out of the Henry Watson Music Library, including some Alcan, the Busoni Concerto, and also many of Ravel's works. And I suppose they influenced me in a number of childhood compositions, uh, which I wrote between 11 and 17, mainly sonatas and one or two shorter pieces. I'd love to play you part of a sonata that I wrote then when I was 14. When I was at college, where I used to turn up late, I'm sorry to say, sometimes, I was very fortunate to meet at this time Peter Maxwell Davis and Alexander Gurr and Harrison Bertwistle, and we founded the group New Music Manchester, which had as its aim to bring concerts in the northern area. Many of the members of the New Music Manchester group were later to become famous in British modern music. John Ogden's exceptional technical skill was soon noticed. I was having a piano lesson with my piano teacher in the Royal College in Manchester, that was Hedwig Stein, and I was doing the Chopin study in thirds, and I was going... <laughs> not getting very far with it and then somebody was insensitive enough to start playing it in the next room and i thought who the hell is that playing it so wonderfully can you remember oh, it yes. <laughs> and of course it was you yeah. And it could have been nobody else. And I said, who is that? And my teacher said, well, that's John Ogden. And I thought, well, I must get to know this person. He didn't uh, speak easily, um, although what he did say was generally to the point. Uh, he was very widely interested in music. He, he's not just a sort of dumb pianist by any means. We had an enormous number of discussions and also on literature. James Joyce was a great inspiration, um, and Sunday recommended him, as did Max, and we all studied it. I was amazed by his insights into, um, never mind music, but films and literature, and um, very, <laughs> very often funny and rude comments about works of art or whatever it was. And um, he was a very stimulating companion and I find still is. He's got an enormous sense of humour. You have to work sometimes a little bit um, because he sometimes is withdrawn but I think it's not difficult to get through that and uh, all that wit and humour and I think rumbustiousness is the right word. It's there and obviously it does come out in the music but it's a great pleasure when it comes out in the conversation and in the day-to-day -day workings with the man too. The problem with John in our dealings with him, when I say our, I mean the sort of modern music composers, uh, was really preventing him uh, going off into roulades of arpeggio and other pieces in the middle of rehearsals. He uh, liked to keep his fingers on the keyboard, and we used to have a sort of motto which was said, Stop Ogden. Well, if he showed me a piece that went sort of... Um, uh, I would tend to, I guess, go into roulades around it, like sort of... It wasn't what 
what he wanted, of course. He just wanted a straight performance of his sonata, his very fine sonata, I think. Yes, I did go off into Roulard in those days. It must have been, you know, youth, youthful glee or something. What I remember him for is, on the one hand, the rather old-fashioned Listian bravura, um, the swashing up and down the keyboard and handfuls of notes and all the rest of it, but uh, just as much, uh, the sudden pianissimos and the control of colour controls perhaps the wrong word, the achievement of colour on the piano, because I don't think it was controlled, it was improvised. And I don't think uh, that he always played the same piece in the same way. Uh, he responded to the feeling. On the other hand, uh, in dealing with my own music or with other modern music, which I foisted on him, uh, he was very, very careful to be precise. It's, it's like the just piece. the way that you breathe the first two phrases. Do you want to just play the first two again, which yes. I think it's just very yes, it interesting that you play them as they breathe naturally. <laughs> With the, the end of the phrase very clearly defined. And side figure. By the way, there's this too. Then the argument goes on. And then, as if it doesn't care at all after this, it just walks. strange chord yes <laughs> but you know one appreciates that particularly when one's young that somebody can yes. actually get character out of music and it's not just yeah. notes in 1956 John Ogden was asked to fill in at 24 hours notice for a soloist who had fallen ill at a concert given by the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic he played the work to the manor born it was big beautiful sound as he always John has always had a what I call an orchestral sound in playing the piano and this in this big which is like a piano symphony really uh, this was a, a remarkable triumph for him but while I was conducting I did notice that when the turner over was a little bit late perhaps in in turning the page John was actually at the piano Peering to see what the next bar was on the pa and, and my suspicions were aroused. I mean, there was nothing he got through and everything was fine. But afterwards I said, John, had you really studied and played the Brahms B flat? He said, no. He said, I knew the music all right. I, I'd heard it a lot of times. So in 24 hours or less, he'd been able to encompass this phenomenally difficult work. In 1962, Ogden was entered for the most important piano competition in the world, the International Tchaikovsky Competition in Moscow. Первым из зарубежных гостей в Москве выступил английский пианист Джон Огден, победитель второго международного конкурса имени Чайковского. Он исполняет прелюд собственного сочинения. Концерт Джона Огдена прошел с большим успехом. John Ogden's main rival in the competition was the young Russian pianist Vladimir Ashkenazi. I 
I knew that the Tchaikovsky piano concerto was not exactly my piece. I'm not such a big fellow. This is really for the likes of John, you know. But here I was, you know, trying to master that monstrous piece full of huge chords and octaves. Uh, John played tremendously. Um, it is his piece, and he's a virtuoso, and he has big hands and complete command of a piece like that. In the end, the prize was shared by Ashkenazi and John Ogden. Mr. Ogden, congratulations on your success Thank in you Moscow. Uh, I understand Mr. Khrushchev spoke to you. What did he say? Well, he was kind enough to say I deserved the prize, but mainly he seemed fascinated by my beard, which he, didn't, which he said he wasn't sure whether it was a real one. And he said he was tempted to pull it to make sure, but that he wouldn't do so because it would create an international situation if he did. What did you think of the standard of the Russian pianists? I thought it was extremely high. They were all extremely well prepared. John and I were very good friends during the competition. I saw him a few times. He um, seemed to be very complimentary about my playing, and I was very impressed with his playing. So there was no problems between us. I've always considered my style of playing was very influenced by Ashkenazi. I first heard him in the 1956 Brussels competition, uh, where he played the Chopin C major study in a way that Brenda's described as haunting and magical. And he achieved this extraordinary performance by keeping the right hand very quiet. <laughs> I've noticed his ability to take chords, which well, many pianists tend to spread slightly, like a single note, setting the whole hand with absolute precision, which is very unusual. So I consider I've been very much influenced by Volodya. I met him afterwards, as we all tended to do from time to time, and asked him what he thought about meeting Khrushchev, which seemed a rather astonishing thing for any friend of mine to have done. And um, he said, oh, well, it was all right, I suppose. And I had the impression that 
as a musical experience, it wasn't that different um, from playing a club recital in Heckmanwijk or somewhere. Um, he takes all music as the same, and he's I, the thing I the point I always want to make really is that he's basically interested in music. People around him may be interested in his career and uh, everything he's achieved, but over the years I've noticed no change in John. Um, when I've seen him, which isn't every day, he's, a, he's only concerned with music. Well, before the competition, um, we were just two struggling musicians. You know, we had uh, a little maze, well, a maisonette in Didsbury. Uh, side of a very old house, a tall house, and we had a couple of pianos there, one up and one down. And uh, we just used to practice five hours a day, both, you know, in teaching, and John was doing concerts and um, struggling on. Um, and then, um, and then Sir Robert Meyer made it possible for John to go to Moscow. He made the funds available for him to go, and he went. And um, nobody really thought he was going to win this competition, but he, he did, so. Um, then our lives tra changed quite dramatically after that. Um, well, we're, well, we moved from Manchester. We were going to do that anyway. But um, we were flooded with work, you see. Well, John was flooded with work. And, um, of course, his, um, his concert fee went up considerably. And, and um, almost overnight, as it were, he became an international star. And so we were just traveling the whole time. It was tremendous fun. And um, we were just sort of on a cloud of uh, concerts and um, parties and recording sessions. And we just went on and on. It was lovely. <laughs> Straight from the hall to the station for the night train to Warsaw, 126 people with luggage and instruments. It took quite some organising. I hope, hope John isn't there, see. I got the lower bunk. Soloists and conductors travelled with the orchestra for the whole tour. John Ogden was with them in America in 1965. He's very well known in Eastern Europe. He played at six of the 12 concerts with both the conductors. And he seemed able to work in the most unlikely places. Of course, you know, John's um, public image probably uh, is, runs counter to his uh, feats of pianism because he, he's large, you know, he shambles onto the platform, sits down there, and you think, well, this will be heavy weather. On the contrary, flights of extraordinary brilliance, uh, prestissimo scherzos with, with, with a, a kind of gossamer touch. So you see, his appearance often belies the pianistic prodigies that he's capable of. Sometimes the sheer compass of his uh, imagination means that he, he could take on a bit too much. He's rather like a, a racehorse, you know, which suddenly took to, to jumping fences when he's been, always been on the flat, if I may use that simile. Um, one, one would then feel that 
uh, one should apply safeguards. In other words, he might perhaps uh, shoot off uh, in, a, in a manner not consistent with the true rhythm. I mean, one has to look at those things. Or he gets excited, he would, he would use his phenomenal fingers. I don't want to give the image of somebody who mere, was merely interested in the technique of his playing, not at all. His fingers were the incidental instruments, the machine, which, he was, which his mind was able to utilize. <laughs> If you can uh, not hurry those, just keep those absolutely yes. hold it back a bit. Yes. You, you can hold keep it back it. a bit. Da -da 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 -da. In, a, in a tight no, rhythm. It's tight rhythm, yeah. Tight. It's very smooth, this lot, very smooth. The run yeah. down there, as smooth as possible. Yeah. So that the whole thing builds up by itself without yes. needing to be pushed. See what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the reasons why I can sight read so marvellously that the thing goes straight through the eye and to, into the hands in a way that I've not seen uh, surpassed anyway by anybody else. Perhaps the fact that he can sight read so marvellously well means that uh, he doesn't always quite get to the heart of it because he doesn't stop to think about it quite enough. But uh, when he does, and you know, with a bit of encouragement, he certainly will, and he's, he's got it all there, and he can do absolutely anything, absolutely anything. In 1973, John Ogden had a severe mental breakdown, which brought his career to a standstill. When the breakdown came, it was really dramatic and very painful. And I would say that it took us six years to recover and get stable again. It took six years to get the right drugs of exploration, drug after drug after drug. The worst thing was um, dragging in and out of the mental hospitals, the Maudsley Hospital in particular, you know, visiting lot wards and this sort of thing. Thank you. 
Various interpretations have been given for John Ogden's illness, and even now, there's no sure diagnosis. Some doctors think it was schizophrenia. Some think it was manic depression. Others believe it was the expression of an exceptionally obsessive personality. The effects included periods of disorientation and violent attacks on himself and on his wife. In the years where John became ill, if he became ill, I'm told he became ill, but when he was at his illest, um, he didn't strike me as terribly different from any other time, but then perhaps he wasn't having an attack at that time. I think uh, that the astonishing musical gifts uh, which he displayed from the moment uh, he appeared and which appear to me to have remained constant throughout, have sometimes taken a very positive, even glamorous form, which have made him into a great pianist. But it's the same John Ogden who was playing the piano for some other patients in, a, in the Maudsley. Uh, I didn't see that it was a different man, and he didn't play any more casually uh, on that upright in the Maudsley than he did on the Steinway in the Festival Hall. And after his recuperation, I went to see him along with David Wilde, I remember, and we talked about an opera on Herman Melville, who was a great favorite of his. Uh, he was planning to compose, and I can't say that I noticed any great difference in the quality of his conversation or thought then uh, to any other time. And I don't know how to interpret that, but it seems to me that all these different things go hand in hand. He's, after all, not the pianist, not the first pianist, uh, nor the first distinguished composer, nor the first thinker who has had difficulties of the type he's allegedly had. When I broke down in the 70s, I had some troubles with coordination during to take due to taking certain drugs. Um, but it feels all right now. I'm on a, a very well-spaced sort of regimen of drugs and tablets, and it feels very good now. Savabchi, who was 38 years old when he wrote Opus Clavicembalisticum, produced a piece of piano music that has been said to be the longest piano piece without repetition. It carries a very strong line of melody, in my opinion, which, of course, does get a little bit obscured by the amount of decoration, but has moments of great beauty. I mean, a poetic moment of inwardness in the variations. The contrast of textures with 
the following variation, variation 34, is quite extreme. <laughs> I think something that has to be said about John Ogden is this extraordinary facility he has, not only technically, to play difficult music with dazzling brilliance and extraordinary delicacy where it is required. Similar gifts regarding sheer stamina, not just technical stamina, but a kind of, of mental stamina that allows him to... to uh, tackle these large-scale works. So, you see, he, he doesn't wilt physically at the end of the performance of a Busoni concerto or a, a Sorabji Opus Clavicembalisticum, but also I think there is the, the mental stamina that enables him to get to the end of a two-hour work like that. So it's quite remarkable. I suspect that the thing that makes John different from most pianists is that John is a composer. This is something which brings very special insights into a performance, that the performer knows how that piece has been put together. If not in particular individual detail, he is at least familiar with the process of putting music together, and it comes out when he plays it as something which is more structured, more balanced, and there is always a sense of exploration of the composer's mind.
Well, I've always been an enthusiastic cinema goer. And the battleship Potemkin, say, and On the Waterfront, and the various John Huston movies, they've all inspired me in my composing. Popcorn, Hello. please. Hello, Thank Miss. You. Which word would you like? Oh, the sweet would be lovely. Thanks all. And I must say, I'm very enthusiastic about the idea of composing a film score of some sort at some time. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. The birds! The birds! He rises! John Ogden sportingly agreed to show us how he might work on a new composition based on John Huston's film of Moby Dick. First, he improvises to the closing sequence of the film. Immediately afterwards, he starts putting the musical ideas together. This sequence at the end of Moby Dick represents Captain Ahab's last attempt to kill the whale that harmed him years before. Um, in trying to interpret it in pianistic terms, one would have in mind the character of the captain, the beauty of the sea and natural surroundings and the almost supernatural beauty of the white whale, white whales being extremely rare. Um, the whiteness of the whale you might represent. And the character of the captain, perhaps sort of. And the, uh, the beauty of the natural surroundings in a more sort of... Um, different sort of pianistic effects, really. Um, the positioning of, of the climactic scene is worked up to a considerable length in the book and in the film also. One feels a sense of satisfaction that the climax of an adventure has been reached. The captain has made his third attempt against the whale, and half the crew have, have left the boat which is being stove in, and the captain is actually mounting the whale in an attempt to exact vengeance. The astonished crew have seen the captain go under, strapped apparently to the whale, and are trying to save themselves, and are stupefied that Moby Dick is still alive, for all the massive harpoons in him unharmed. The captain has arisen like some latter-day Christ lashed to the whale. And the whale, being of an unusual savagery for whales, turns and breaks the boat in two. The piece I improvise tries to reflect the emotions of the surviving crew members at the thought 
of the disaster that has befallen them. In the film, it now becomes obvious that there are no survivors from the Pequod's ill-fated expedition, except Ishmael, who joined the crew and is the only one left to tell the story as an orphan. Um, well, in the piece I'm going to play, I try to coordinate the different impressions I had of the film of Moby Dick in its closing scene. The beauty of the seagulls, the whiteness of the whale, the monomania of Captain Ahab, and the evident distress of his crew as their voyage reaches a tragic end. Thank you. <laughs> 